Good afternoon, everyone. We, I think our numbers are starting to stabilize. So we might start, start getting going in a minute. Um, we're really grateful for everyone who could come along today and made, made time in their day to, to join us for this webinar. As I was just saying, we're really excited to be covering this content um, and this topic is it's something that um, you know, there's been some great interest in and lots of questions around. So hopefully it will be useful to you um, and we can go from there. So to start today, I would like to, um, before we begin, I'd, I'd really like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia um, and recognize their continuing connection to land, water and culture. So Julie and I are currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. Um, and if you would like to, you're very welcome to pop into the chat what land you're joining us from today for this webinar. We'd love to hear from you as well. So a bit of housekeeping, make sure we're all on the same page as we get going today. So um, just to let you know, as participants of this Zoom webinar, you are currently on what's called listen only mode. Um, and what this means is that we, Julie and I, cannot hear or see you. Um, but we will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A function instead. Um, and we are recording the session and it will be made available to you along with the slide handouts after the webinar. So you'll get emails sent through when these are available and ready. Um, and the webinar recording is also gonna be available on the Matilda Center YouTube channel. Um, so that'll be posted in the coming days. And again, you'll be notified by email when this recording is available for you to hop on and have a look at. Um, and we will be leaving time for a Q&A session after the presentation. Um, so, you know, as we're chatting through things, please feel free to add some questions into the Q&A box. So that should be down at the bottom of your screens where your sort of Zoom um, controls and options are. Um, and we will also be monitoring the chat in addition to the Q&A box if you prefer to use that. So, yeah, we really encourage you to, to pop anything in there um, as you see fit going through the webinar today. So um, do some introductions. I know I've mentioned our names now a few times already, um, but just to introduce ourselves. So my name is um, Dr. Emma Devine, and I work as a postdoctoral research fellow um, at the Matilda Center for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use. Um, and I'm also the project manager of the Learning with FASD project. Um, so really interested in um, substance use, um, prenatal health, um, and prevention is sort of where my research interests lie and how I got involved in this project as well. Um, and I'll just pass over now to Julia, who will introduce herself. Thanks, Emma. Um, so I'm a research officer for Learning with FASD at the Matilda Centre. Um, so I've been working on this project since we started back in 2020. Um, so it's something I'm really passionate about and really love working on. So I'm really excited to be holding this webinar for you today. Wonderful, thank you, Julia. So we wanted as well, just to give you a quick overview. You know what you're sort of getting yourself into for the next 40, 50 minutes or so. Um, so we thought we would start by discussing and providing a little bit of that background that's really important um, to subsequently understand the strategy. So we will start by looking at the impact a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder on learning and behavior. So what that might look like, what the, the sort of root causes to that might be um, and go from there. And then the second half of the webinar is going to focus on strategies and adjustments um, that teachers and support staff can implement um, in a school context to better support children with FASD. Um, and as I've just mentioned, we will also wrap up with a Q&A session um, and have time for that at the end as well. So I'll hand over to Julia and I to, to take us over the first part of the webinar. Perfect. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, so as Emma just said, the first section today, um, we're going to be looking at the impact of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder on learning behavior, um, because we think it's really important to have an understanding of how FASD um, affects learning behavior to then be able to implement those um, supports and adjustments in the classroom. 
Yes, what I just popped into the chat was a link to the quiz, which is on our website. So it's just a short seven questions, true or false. And we just wanted to start you off to get a bit of an idea of what you actually know about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, so we'll give everyone a few minutes to just um, answer those questions. And if you wanted to pop into the chat when you were done, maybe what score you got in the end, or perhaps if there was anything in the quiz that surprised you, something you didn't know. Um, so we'll just give you a few minutes to answer a few questions. And yeah, as I said, if you're comfortable, pop something in the chat when you're done. We're not frightening anyone by making you do a quiz immediately, but as I said, just a um, a little thing to get started. Well, I can see um, some responses coming through. So yeah, it looks like a couple of people are done with the quiz. And yeah, as I said, feel free to pop in the chat anything that you were surprised to learn or whether you're familiar with all that information already, even your score, if you feel like sharing that. But again, no pressure. So yeah, hopefully everyone's had a few minutes to do that. Um, Yep, I can see someone saying took a couple of guesses and uh, a few things about the diagnostic terminology. Um, so again, we will sort of hopefully answer all of your questions in the coming hour, um, but I might move on now that we've had a chance to sort of look at the quiz um, and just start off with kind of an introduction about what is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Because I know some of you here today will be very familiar with that already, but some people might not be as familiar with sort of the information around it. So we just wanted to cover this to begin with. Um, so fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is a diagnostic term that's used to describe the effects of prenatal exposure to alcohol. So alcohol is what's called a teratogen, which is a toxin that can pass through the placenta to an unborn child and interrupt normal development by damaging the brain and organs. So concerningly, the estimates range between 50 to 70% of Australian women report drinking alcohol during pregnancy, which is one of the highest rates of alcohol consumption in pregnancy worldwide. So this includes the very early stages of pregnancy. However, ever the, um, the estimates say the rate stays around 25% of women who report alcohol consumption after knowledge of pregnancy. So there is no safe time or amount of alcohol to use during pregnancy. Heavy drinking or binge drinking does carry the greatest risk. However, we know that even low levels of alcohol consumption can cause FASD. Um, and while we are here, just on the, those few brief comments about the diagnostic terminology, um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Have your attention, please. Touching on the fire evacuation system is now in progress. Uh, technical difficulty number two. Let me hop in here. <laughs> right. To get to your slide. All right. So Julia was just saying, um, you know, that there is never a safe time, um, you know, during a pregnancy, um, you know, to be consuming alcohol. Um, and different stages of the pregnancy will be associated with different levels of risk. Um, and there is still a lot we don't know in this space as well. Um, just while we're here as well. Oh, are you back, Julia? Yes, I think the fire alarm testing has stopped, so apologies for oh, that. I'll pass back over to you. Thanks, Emma. There's always something. Um, so as I was just saying, um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is the only diagnostic terminology in Australia that should be used to describe an individual prenatally exposed to alcohol. 
Um, so since 2016, when the new Australian guidelines for the diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder were introduced, we no longer use terms like fetal alcohol syndrome or um, alcohol-related birth defects or anything else like that. Sorry, I'll just mute. Really sorry, everyone. This was not something that we expect to be happening in the office today. So currently we don't have accurate estimates of the prevalence rates of FASD in Australia, but there is some international research that has looked into this. Um, and, you know, looking at those that are sort of similar in terms of, um, you know, similar Western societies as Australia would be, um, the experts estimate that it does affect between two um, and 5% of the general population. So this means that at the higher end of the estimate, I'll let Julia. Thanks, Emma. Higher um, end of the estimate. Yeah, so as Emma was saying, um, it does, they estimate that it could affect between two to 5% of our population. Um, so at the higher end, this could be around 15,000 children being born with FASD in Australia each year. Um, so the prevalence of FASD is higher among certain populations, um, such as children in the care of child protection services, the youth justice system, some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, and children in special education services. Um, however, we want to be really clear that FASD is not an issue that's confined to any particular community or demographic. Um, it's a disorder that crosses pretty much all socioeconomic, racial, and educational boundaries. Um, but just to put some of these estimated prevalence rates into perspective, um, these estimates exceed the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder, Down syndrome, spina bifida, and cerebral palsy in Australia. Um, so FASD is actually the leading preventable cause of non-genetic developmental disability in the world. So it is a lifelong disability. So the effects can vary considerably depending on the amount and timing of exposure to alcohol in utero. So it is often referred to as an invisible disability as it often goes undetected. So the characteristic features you see in the table on the screen um, are seldom apparent at birth, uh, particularly as some research indicates that only a small percentage of individuals with FASD will actually display what's called the sentinel facial features. Um, so these estimates in the research might range from about 5 to 20%. Um, but it is definitely the minority, and that's because that's due to the timing of alcohol exposure in utero. So it must happen within the first 12 weeks um, to actually develop those characteristic facial features. So the disorders are um, often not noticed until a child reaches school age, when behavioural learning difficulties become more evident. Um, so one point that's really important to note about FASD is that the most common signs, particularly in the school environment, are going to be expressed as developmental delays, uh, behavioral challenges, and learning difficulties. Um, but it's really crucial to remember that it's a brain-based disorder. Um, so the focus should be on understanding that sort of performance or impairments are actually based on a physical brain injury. Um, so this is where the idea of can't not won't has emerged in the FASD space. Um, so it's the idea that children with FASD often can't do a certain task or behavior, like follow an instruction rather than they won't do it, so they're not deliberately misbehaving. Um, and every individual with FASD will have their own strengths and challenges. Um, and we did just want to address that this webinar, because we're trying to sort of give you a lot of information about the impact of FASD, it does have a lot of focus on the deficits, but it is really important to try and take a strengths-based approach where possible. Um, but yeah, we did just want to acknowledge that because of the, the content of this webinar, we are you know, focusing a bit on the challenges, but that's not necessarily what we always wanna focus on when talking about children with FASD. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, each individual will have their own strengths and challenges, but all will have difficulty in at least three of these 10 neurodevelopmental domains, which you can see in the diagnostic criteria. Um, so we're gonna go into a little more detail about these now. Um, so these 10 neurodevelopmental domains, um, they're crucial for diagnosis. So as I noted in the last slide, every child with a diagnosis of FASD will have impairments in at least three of these 10 domains. 
Um, but what's also important to note is that there's no typical pattern of impairment in FASD that might be seen in autism spectrum disorder or ADHD. Um, so I will talk you through these domains in just a little detail. So academic achievement in this context refers to skills in reading, mathematics, and literacy. Um, cognition is the process of knowing, perception, awareness, and judgment. So this domain includes things like IQ, verbal and nonverbal reasoning skills, um, the ability to understand concepts or learn new skills and facts, um, and also the intake and output of information. So a child with FASD could actually have impairments in any or all of these aspects of cognition. Um, attention is the ability to choose and concentrate on relevant information. Um, so this could be focusing on a particular stimuli or focusing on two or more things at the same time. Um, attention also includes the ability to switch your focus between two things. Um, and finally, focusing, focusing on something for a long period of time and resisting any distractions. Um, so the domain of memory we here refers to the processes that we use to acquire store, retain, and retrieve information. Um, so this includes sort of your overall memory, but it also includes verbal memory and also your visual memory for things that you've seen. The language domain here includes expressive and receptive language skills. Um, so expressive language is how a child uses words to express themselves. Um, and receptive language is the ability to understand words and language. So high level language skills include sort of advanced vocabulary, um, understanding word relationships and paraphrasing. So executive function is actually quite a broad domain. Um, so executive function is sort of the high level skills that we need to organize and control our own thoughts and behaviors. Um, so this includes things like impulse, impulse control, um, inhibition, so inhibiting inappropriate behavior. Um, it also includes hyperactivity, planning and problem solving, and sort of shifting in cognitive flexibility. Um, and also a concept called working memory, which is the ability to hold multiple pieces of information in your mind at one time. Um, so for example, if you have instructions in three steps, it's the ability to hold all three steps of those instructions in your mind and follow them. Um, so motor skills here are related to moving and coordinating the muscles of the body. Um, so this includes fine motor skills, so like tying your shoelace, using cutlery, um, gross motor skills like balance and physical strength, and also what we call graphomotor skills, so that's handwriting. And the adaptive behavior, social skills or social communication domain refers to the life skills that enable an individual to participate successfully in day-to-day -day activities. Um, so these include daily living skills like age-appropriate self-care and also communication and socialization skills. So next we have brain structure and neurology, which are actual structural brain abnormalities, um, seizures and other neurological diagnoses. Um, but it is important to note for this domain, the presentations aren't easily identifiable in the school setting. Um, so we haven't really focused on this one. And then finally, we have something called affect regulation or emotion regulation. So this is the ability to um, modulate our emotions, moods, feelings, and expressions to meet the demands of our environment. So I understand that was a lot of information to take in, um, but what's really important, I think, to take away from this is that fetal alcohol spectrum disorder can affect so many different areas of brain functioning. Um, so, you know, even if a child with FASD has impairments in three of these areas, you can really see how their ability to learn and behave in the school environment will be seriously impacted by the deficits associated with FASD. Um, you know, for example, if a child has memory deficits, they'll find it hard to remember and recall a lesson from the day before. And if they struggle with something like executive function, they might not be able to inhibit inappropriate behavior or be able to generalize information between school and home, or they might struggle with things like problem solving. 
So in addition to these domains, um, children with FASD might also experience sensory processing issues. Um, so this is being hyper or hyposensitive to certain sensations. Um, they might also experience problems with sleep, growth problems, and then other issues relating to birth defects. So what I've put here on the screen are some common challenges that might be experienced by a child with FASD as a result of their neurodevelopmental impairments. Um, so what we're trying to display here are the behaviours or difficulties that you might actually observe in the school environment, but are caused by a neurodevelopmental impairment. Um, so for example, you might have a student that, you know, struggles to learn and remember new information. So they have these learning challenges, but that's because perhaps their, you know, their memory is impaired by the impacts of FASD. Um, so same as behavioural things you might observe, they might be hyperactive, um, be inattentive and display inappropriate behavior. But again, that's actually coming from a result of an impairment to their executive functioning. And with um, social skills, they might have difficulty making friends or poor understanding of boundaries. Um, some emotional challenges might be mood swings, which can be difficult to control or meltdowns. And again, that's because there's an actual impairment in their ability to um, regulate their emotion or the like, affect is what it's known as, um, which is coming from that brain injury associated with bad D. They might often appear as sort of young for their age, which is what you'd see um, expressed as developmental delays. Or you might have students that be can become overwhelmed by sensory information, um, which is again, coming from those neurodevelopmental impairments. So we also just wanted to touch on quickly was the way that some difficulties associated with FASD might be expressed in the classroom and how occasionally they can actually be misinterpreted as um, different things when really the reason is coming from these deficits. Um, so for example, you might have a student that repeatedly makes the same mistakes and you know, in the past, this could have been interpreted as sort of misconduct or not trying hard enough. Um, but the real reason might be that student has difficulty with memory or generalizing information between situations. Um, so something else might be being non-compliant, which may be interpreted again as sort of misconduct, attention seeking or stubbornness. Um, but in reality, that's caused by sort of difficulty translating verbal instructions into actions or requiring additional time to process information. Um, something like not sitting still and fidgeting could perhaps be misinterpreted again as attention seeking or bothering others. But in actuality, a student with FASD might have a neurologically based need to move while learning. They might be experiencing a sensory overload due to sensory processing difficulties or they might just not have um, a good understanding of personal space and boundaries due to deficits in social skills. Um, and finally, something like not completing homework or class activities might be interpreted as being lazy, being irresponsible, having unsupportive caregivers, um, when in actuality, it could be something like memory deficits are affecting their ability to remember the lesson from class and transfer it to home. So again, there might be that difficulty transferring lessons between school and home, or just difficulty understanding expectations and what's required of them. Um, so that section was just, as I said, um, we felt it was really important to give you a lot of information about how FASD actually might impact learning and behavior to sort of better equip you to then employ um, strategies and adjustments in the classroom to better support students with FASD. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just hand over to Emma to uh, talk you through the second section of the webinar. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, I'm going to hop in here um, to discuss some of the, the real examples of the strategies and adjustments that can be used. Um, so we now have a really good understanding of, you know, the neurological domains that are impacted by FASD, how this might manifest in behavior, which, as Julia mentioned, really comes up in the classroom setting and, and is where FASD is often, you know, that around that time that FASD is often diagnosed. Um, and now we're going to move into the strategies and, and the strategies does have a much more strength based focus because, um, you know, you'll be working with this child 
you'll know what they enjoy, what they, you know, excel at, what, um, you know, they, they are engaged in doing in the classroom and you can maybe fit some of these strategies or select the strategies that may be best suited for that child as well. But before um, we get into the strategies, there are just a couple of points that we wanted to make or to flag. Um, the first being that this is not an exhaustive list of strategies by any means. Um, we are selecting um, you know, some that are maybe more common, more appropriate for some of the more common presentations of FASD um, and you know, are conscious not to overload you. Um, but we are very keen if there is something that we don't cover today that you'd like to have more information about, our contact details will be up on the end of the slides um, as well. And we're very happy to hear from you. We'll, we'll see if we can't um, provide you with some more resources in that space as well. Um, so yes, to summarize, these are just a couple um, of strategies that can support children with FASD in a number of the neurodevelopmental domains we've discussed. <clears throat> um, we'd also like to acknowledge that we are approaching this topic from a research background. Um, so we're providing you with strategies that have been supported by evidence, uh, strong evidence base, um, and that have been previously shown to be effective for students with FASD in the past. We do, of course, acknowledge that we do not come from an education background um, and that you are going to be the people who have the expertise in this area. So as we're going through the strategies, um, we'd also be really interested to hear. Um, so please share in the chat um, if you've used any of these strategies before, um, if you've had um, any experience with these, if something sort of resonates with you, um, if something, you know, seems like is something you might like to use down the line as well. So very keen to hear your thoughts on this as well. Um, the next then is that every child with FASD, as we've mentioned, is going to be different. The de neurodevelopmental domains that are impacted um, are going to be different um, and they will have different strengths and challenges. So not every strategy that we discussed today will be effective for every child with FASD. And it's really important to get to know the student and find out what works for them. Um, the last one then is that it's really important to maintain flexibility um, in employing these strategies. So one strategy that was effective one day may not be effective the next day. Um, and these strategies um, are of course designed for children with FASD, but as we mentioned earlier, FASD does have a lot of overlap with other neurodevelopmental disorders. So um, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD. So some of these um, strategies may also be quite useful or beneficial for other children who might be experiencing difficulty in the classroom or just other students. Um, as well, they might just be helpful. So we just wanted to, to give a bit of that context and a bit of that preface first as well. So these are the same 10 neurodevelopmental domains um, that Julia spoke about earlier. I just wanted to flag that in discussing strategies to better support a child with FASD, we will be focusing on those in green. So we'll be looking um, at strategies for cognition, attention, memory, language, executive function, motor skills, um, as well as social skills and communication. And we will also be looking at sensory processing, which I know is not a, one of the tenure developmental domains, but it is something um, that can often be a significant difficulty with children with FASD. Those in red are those that we won't be focusing on. So fairly self-explanatory is brain structure. Um, we cannot alter brain structure, certainly not in a um, in a classroom, um, we don't have fMRIs and, and whatnot, so we're, we're leaving that one for today. Um, and we also won't be focusing on affect regulation or academic achievement. And this is because these can often um, be a consequence of the presence or absence of effective strategies um, for the other domains. So for example, if a child's other needs are being supported um, through effective strategies, then their academic achievement is likely to improve as a consequence of this or as a result of these strategies. Um, and their affect regulation may stabilize if they're not experiencing, um, you know, that sensory overload in the classroom and if some of maybe their triggers have been removed um, through the implementation of some of these strategies as well. So just a bit of rationale for why we're doing what we're doing. Now, getting into the actual strategies. So first one we're going to look at um, the first strategy is to support memory um, and that's repetition. So due to the impact of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder on memory, a child might have difficulty recalling learned information. Um, and it can also be common for a child with FASD to demonstrate inconsistent recall. So they may remember um, information one day, um, but not be able to remember, remember it the next day or a week down the line. Um, 
So that's where it's sort of the memory problems might manifest. So consistent repetition of new information, of new skills, um, repetition of instructions, um, and repetition of routine can really assist a child by reinforcing that learned information. Um, so really helping them with the memory and the recall. And then visual aids to cue recall can also be really helpful. So this might be something like a visual depiction of the class rules that is on the wall. Um, and this can help a child um, who's remembered the information but might have difficulty retrieving it um, or retrieving the relevant piece of information in, in the relevant situation as well. Um, so in the case um, of the example of the visual aid of the class rules, um, this cues the child to retrieve the right information for that context. And finally, already alluded to in that repetition is that maintaining a consistent routine and structure can also be really helpful for a child who experiences difficulty with memory as a result of FASD. Um, so much like the visual aids, a regular routine and structure can assist with cueing this recall um, to help them remember sort of, and become familiar with tasks and activities as well. And on our fact sheet um, that's up on the website, we do actually link out to sort of a template for a routine that might be useful if you were looking for something like that as well. Just looking then um, towards the attention. Um, so we've mentioned and, and spoken a bit about the ability to focus and concentrate on relevant information can be impaired in a child with FASD. Um, so before beginning an activity, so giving an instruction, starting a lesson, starting reading a story or whatever it might be, um, it's really important to engage the child to ensure that they're listening and watching. Um, so it can be useful to say their name gently, um, you know, just as a way of focusing their attention um, on you before you begin speaking the content of the, you know, around the activity or the task that they need to know. Um, and some children with FASD also experience the need to move or to fidget frequency. Um, frequently, um, and this helps them to de-escalate or sort of calm down and, and self-regulate. Um, so one thing that has been found to be quite effective in this um, in this case is fidget items. So these can be really useful to help children relax, focus their attention. Um, they should be small, quiet, and can include things like stress balls, even a textured fabric or a cushion. Um, and then specialized fidget toys or plush toys as well. Now I know fidget toys um those fidget spinner things were really popular there for a hot minute and um can be quite annoying to look at but I think those pop boards now I'm not super I haven't had a good play on one of them but those pop boards are really popular now as well um and we also know that weighted blankets can also be really useful to help a child remain calm in some situations um, but there is sort of a line and, and, and the fidget items might be a bit of trial and error because it's important to be aware and be cautious of the fact that um, a fidget item can also overstimulate. Um, so just it's important to try and see if you can get that balance right. So moving on then to cognition. Um, one aspect of cognition is the ability to process information. So to take in information um, and to you know, respond and react and, and output that information in a way. Um, and FASD can affect a child's ability to process information, which means they may take longer to, to take in, respond to um, both visual and auditory information. Um, so some FASD experts have referred to children with FASD as a, a 10 second child in a one second world. So I think you know, that phrase is just really helpful for, for remembering that we all move super quickly and and, you know, slowing down um, and just allowing a child that space and that additional time to respond to questions, um, to complete a task um, is going to be really helpful and really beneficial. So, for example, if you ask a student with FASD a question, you know, trying to allow more time before moving on or providing the answer. Um, and we, as we noted earlier, there is no typical pattern of impairment here and each child will have their own strengths and challenges. So it's important to, to personalize the teaching strategy for each student according to their strengths and capacities and interests. Um, so we know that cognitive impairments and FASD can affect a child's ability to learn new information. But if you have a student that excels at physical activity, which is something that can be quite common, playing a team sport can be used here and can be used to teach a child how to follow rules, how to cooperate, um, so it's about thinking of other ways to sort of learn, the, you know, the important thing that's actually trying to be taught sometimes as well. 
Um, impairments in cognition can also result in difficulty with abstract thinking. Um, so visual aids to make abstract concepts more concrete and more sort of tangible can be really um, helpful for a child as well. So some examples of this could be to use dice or coins or number lines or something that, you know, can be looked at or held um, for maths lessons. Um, using an analog clock or a sand timer as well to help children visualize a really abstract concept like time um, has, has also been found to be useful. Um, we have structure and routine cropping up again. Um, it, it does, it can be really helpful for, for several of the different domains that may be impacted. Um, so cognitive difficulties um, associated with FASD can often affect the student's ability um, adjusting to change or shifting to new activities so that task, swift, um, task switching um, does use quite a high cognitive load. So by maintaining consistent, predictable routines, it allows a child to know what's coming next, what to expect, um, and can reduce that cognitive load and improve their ability to learn. It can also decrease anxiety as well, which will help with affect regulation um, as well. If you do have to, you know, you've, you've established um, you know, very well structured routines and that needs to be broken for whatever reason. Um, it's important to prepare a child with FASD for that change in advance of that change. So, you know, if a school trip is coming up, um, if the changing, um, a changing order of lessons is happening, you know, just making that clear in advance instead of just bringing that change on them is also really, really helpful. So children with FASD um, often have challenges with or difficulties with um, communication. And this includes both speech, so articulation, um, as well as language. So more that understanding um, and ability to express themselves. So when giving instruction, it's really important to use simple, concrete language that states exactly what you want the child to do. Um, and it's really important to use or to avoid using, I should say, words with double meanings or figures of speech or metaphors or, or things that we use quite frequently in, in language that um, is quite abstract um, and not actually saying what needs to be done. So, for example, instead of saying something like settle down or behave yourself, um, you could say, please stop talking. Um, or you know, use, using direct, clear instructions like please stay in your seat instead of don't wander or you know the rules or something like that. Um, and it's also important to give short instructions or only one instruction at a time. So memory impairment, the cognitive load comes into play here again, and, and it can impair a student's ability to hold multiple pieces of information in their mind. So just as, a, as an example, instead of saying pack your books away, tidy up your desk, um, you know, break that down. So it's first it's stop writing and put down your pencil and close your workbook and then place your workbook and pencil into your bag. So just breaking it down so it's easier to follow. Um, and, you know, tying in with what I've mentioned as well, it's important to allow time for a student to process this information. Um, that, that 10 second idea comes into play here again. And then finally, visual aids are cropping up again. Um, they can be really helpful to assist with um, communication. So having a visual depiction of the steps in the task um, that you're looking for a student to do, like washing your hands um, can be really useful to accompany a verbal instruction. So sensory processing, I'm just seeing that um, so some things coming through in the chat, which is really um, great to see. So I'll just run through these and then we can incorporate them into the Q&A and, and chat at the end as well. So looking then at sensory processing. So this can be a real challenge for children with FASD. So classrooms can often be quite busy or quite noisy. There's just a lot going on. A lot of decorations maybe up. There's a lot of things. Um, and all of this can contribute and, and really sort of uh, result in a, an overstimulating environment for the for a child um, which may be distracting it may cause anxiety um, so where possible um, a classroom should be structured to decrease the stimulation where you can so using natural light instead of fluorescent lights that may flicker um, trying to minimize excess noise from outside you know if there's a leaf blower or something you know trying to to close that window when that happens instead of just waiting for it to pass um, potentially also allowing a student to use headphones to screen out that noise and you know that gives um, 
a child the, the freedom and the capacity to choose when they feel that they're being overstimulated by the noise. Um, minimizing items on a student's desk or a workspace can also be really helpful. Um, and then building a bit more then on the, the cluttered visual environment, it's important to try and minimize this where possible. So you can maybe remove some colorful displays near the student's workplace. Um, when they're not in use, you can cover them, trying to avoid hanging too many items from windows or ceilings. Um, and those that idea of the warm neutral tones rather than bright colors can be much more calming um, and reduce sensory overload as well. Um, it's important to adapt and personalize the classroom environment, of course, where possible, to support each child according to their individual needs. So when a child in a school environment, um, there may be certain signs or smells, sensations, or other distractions that really impact their ability to learn. Um, and these specific triggers may be small, you might not, you know, notice them at first, um, and they might not be impacting you. It could be, you know, a slight light buzzing, a ticking clock that we're able to sort of dismiss or, or take out of our consciousness quite easy. Um, so identifying or removing and understanding these triggers can also be a really important step towards um, helping with sensory processing difficulties as well. So FASD can also um, impair self-regulation, which is the ability um, to engage in deliberate, thoughtful actions while still remaining attentive um, and emotionally appropriate in the situation. So this is the key, the key role of executive functioning. Um, so in the school environment, this can affect a child's ability to change activities, maintain attention. So something that can be really useful here is allowing frequent breaks. Um, especially ones that include the opportunity for physical exercise or movement um, can be really a, a really useful strategy to improve self-regulation and attention. Um, so one example that, that we've heard from a teacher um, who found it really useful was um, a weight-bearing exercise. So um, they would ask the child to return a stack of, of books back to the library. So this involved them, you know, taking the book. So that was sort of the weight bearing, going to the library, coming back. And it just expends a bit of excess energy as well. And then recess and lunch breaks are really important for a child with FASD. So that idea of, um, you know, expending that energy, getting out, getting moving, taking that break. Um, so yeah, not using you know, the removal um, of recess and, and lunch breaks where possible, um, whether it be for weather or in response to behavior, anything like that in the classroom is important. Um, providing a calm, quiet breakaway space in the classroom where a student can go if they feel overwhelmed, frustrated, feel like they just need to calm down a little bit um, is really useful. Obviously we acknowledge that this is dependent on space constraints and, and a lot of other things in the classroom, but where possible, it can be really useful. Um, but if you are using a space like this, it is though really important to remember that it shouldn't be used um, for punishment in any way, but um, as a tool to instead positively support students to learn to self-regulate um, and to, to go there when they feel the need themselves. Um, there may also be some problems or, or difficulties in, in being able to understand cause and effect or to generalize information between situations. So it is also really important that you maintain consistency in regards to rules or consequences. So making consequences short, concrete, and importantly, as immediate as possible in response to something um, and reminding students of consequences um, so that to help them keep them, keep them in mind. So for example, um, imposing consequences at home for something that the child did at school or vice versa um, is less likely to be effective in teaching the child sort of cause and effect um, due to those challenges in generalizing from one environment to another. Um, so executive functioning deficits affect a child's ability as well to plan or organize. So providing strategies for organization in the classroom, such as you know, detailed daily schedules, um, help in organizing their school supplies, their desk, their locker, um, breaking down tasks um, is really helpful as well and does overlap with that sort of, you know, concrete examples um, and breaking things down into smaller steps as well. Um, FASD can impair a child's social and emotion, emotional skills, which can lead to difficulty with relationships. So sometimes it can be difficult to make friends or they may be subjected to teasing or bullying. 
Um, and this can then result in inappropriate behaviors. Um, inappropriate behaviors are standalone, but they are just responses and reactions to what they're experiencing. So things like aggression or disruptiveness. So what can be really helpful is to model role playing. Um, so modeling behavior that is, um, you know, a more appropriate response. Um, so role playing different situations they might um, find themselves in, as well as rehearsing real life situations can be really useful techniques um, in teaching and promoting those social and emotional skills. Um, so you might, for example, want to script out or role play uh, maybe a school excursion that's coming up um, so that a student can rehearse or be exposed to more appropriate language and behavior around that context. And social scripts and in the context of stories as well can be useful. Um, and because those because students might not be able to generalize information um, from one situation to another because of those um, executive function impairments, it's also important um, you know, to have a script for each situation. So um, anything that you maybe ran through for a school excursion may not be appropriate or um, generalizable to a different context, such as um, you know, a walk to the park or, or something different like that. And then modeling behavior is also really helpful. So we all learn behavior from modeling it from other people. Um, from a very young age, you know, we learn from our parents, our friends, and things like that. And it's the same here. So, you know, demonstrating um, appropriate tone of voice, appropriate body language, appropriate manners, and things like that is all really important as well. And finally, um, we've got motor skills. So as we mentioned, FASD can impair physical skills that are really important for functioning in a school environment. So because of impairments to maybe gross motor skills like balance or physical strengths, it's important that a child with FASD has a secure um, place to seat and supportive seating as well. So that might be about swapping out a chair or making sure you know everything's at the correct heights for them. Um, due to impairments in graphomotor, graphomotor skills, um, allowing extra time for writing or minimizing the amount of writing or copying required for a task can be helpful. You know, so just considering whether it's in, really necessary for the task that it's written out or or whether you know if this could be be done verbally or, or something instead um and we do sort of off the back of this really want to acknowledge that you know all schools are different all classrooms are different all children are different um and the strategies are going to work differently across all of these contexts and across different settings within these contexts um, so as a first step, we do really encourage you, and this is, um, you know, what's been passed on to us as well, is that um, to reach out and, and speak to your learning and support team or any equivalent colleagues and teams that you may have at your school um, to sort of maybe chat through, work through some of these options or, or see what else is out there as well. It can be really important to do. So just to wrap up as well, many of the strategies that we've talked about today um, can um, be found in, and we have two fact sheets on the website. So um, classroom strategies and teaching strategies to support a child um, with learning difficulty or with um, FASD in the classroom. Um, so they are available up on the learning with um, FASD websites. But if you were looking for longer, more in-depth, um, different as well, um, like others, um, resources and, and strategies, we do really, really recommend these two resources. Um, so they can be found on our website. So linked through. Um, on the classroom strategy section if you scroll to the bottom. Um, but yeah, also happy to send through these details in the post webinar email as well. Um, and we'd also like to acknowledge um, that these resources were a great reference for um, some of the content covered in the webinar today. So I'll just have um, a look at the chat. Um, so I'm just going from the bottom because I'm coming into it a bit late. So yeah, it is definitely really difficult to diagnose FASD. Um, because it is so different um, between children um, and between contact, or not between contact, it's so different from, from child to child. Um, and may, it's, it requires a multidisciplinary team um, as well to, to assess it. So it's quite an involved process. Just jump in there to Emma and say that um, often children with FASD are misdiagnosed before they get their, their final um, correct diagnosis. So. Quite often they'll be misdiagnosed with ADHD or autism spectrum disorder, and that results in some treatments or interventions for those um, 
disorders being applied that are not going to be effective for a child with ASD. Um, so I think there's sort of some, a little bit of tracking in New South Wales that found it might take on average about eight years from first presentation at a health service um, to get a correct diagnosis. So there does need to be um, sort of a drastic improvement in diagnostic services in Australia, and which is slowly starting to happen. Um, but we're still sort of a long way off, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. Um, and just if you are looking for more um, information on the referral and diagnostic process for FASI, we do have um, a guide on that process sort of with a focus on the where the role of the teacher comes into play up on the website as well. So um, that might be something you're interested in having a look at, Sophie. Um, any other questions as well about um, you know, we're having a look at both the Q&A as well as the chat. Um, we'll, we'll sort of chat through some of the ones that have come through, but feel free to pop any other questions um, in as we go. We have a few minutes to go through questions. Yeah, just to um, answer one of the questions that Haley's popped in the chat about um, whether children can have both FASD and ADHD. Um, there is some research saying there is a really high rate of comorbidity between the two disorders. So um, a child having both FASD and ADHD, some research says it might be as high as 50% of children with FASD will also have ADHD. Um, but what's really important there too is to consider that the treatment for a combination when a child has FASD and ADHD um, is actually quite different for a child that just has ADHD. Um, so, for example, some medications that you would give to a child that just has ADHD won't work the same way for a child that also has FASD. Um, so that's why it's really important to ensure that the correct and full diagnosis is eventually reached for all children to make sure they're getting the appropriate, you know, support and early intervention that they need. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Julia. And I'm, I'm just reading a few comments that really recommend, you know, occupational therapy, therapy assessments. Um, that can be really helpful for those sensory assessments um, as well and, and some suggestions as well to use um, weighted um, soft toys instead so that's a really a great one to hear. So just, oh, go on Julia sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say I see a question in the chat about um, the diagnostic process being expensive for families and unattainable um, so there's an organization called No FASD in Australia, which is the national organization for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, so that's our peak body um, nationally for all of Australia. And their website has really great information for um, families and parents and carers um, and any other sort of um, professionals that are involved in that process that will have really detailed information about um, the diagnostic process and sort of um, the NDIS and everything that comes with that. Um, there's lots of really detailed information on their website. So I definitely direct you to there if you wanted a bit more detail about that process. Um, and also just to answer the next one from Rebecca, um, in terms of a list of professionals that are FASD aware, um, so there is also a website called FASD Hub. Um, which is an Australian website and on there they have a services directory um, of allied health professionals so you can actually go into that services directory and filter by sort of exactly what service you're after and then what um, I think it's sorted by state that you live in and it will give you a list of services that have um, identified themselves as being FASD aware um, and experienced and so yeah, you can go there and look up something that's relevant and hopefully accessible for you. Um, so that's on the FASD Hub website. Yeah, so we've just got one um, through the Q&A as well, asking whether alcohol consumption early in pregnancy increases risk for developing FASD. Um, so yeah, it definitely does. There is no safe time during pregnancy to be consuming alcohol um, and any alcohol consumed does result in a risk um, for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, yeah. And um, Christine has just noted in the chat that no FASD also has a helpline as well. So you can call there, um, it's on their website. And Emma has just posted a link in the chat to the no FASD website as well for more information. 
we're getting towards the end here are we um so just to sort of wrap up first of all thank you so much for coming today to this webinar and, and apologies and thank you for your um patience while we had a few technical difficulties there at the start um but we're great and we're delighted to have everything um back up and running again for for the end which was great um if you do have any questions that we didn't get to today or there's anything that you think of, um, please feel free to send us an email and get in touch with us um, via Facebook, via Twitter. We're very happy to, to you know, connect and, and to chat there as well. Um, just to confirm as well that the slides um, and the recording will be made available to everyone who registered for the webinar as well. So you can sort of refer back to anything that may have been um, of particular interest. Um, and yeah, a really big thank you from us and the Learning with Plasti team.